Well, greetings everyone and welcome to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. The Law Hour is sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. The Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and in more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. For more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordon.org. Again, that's georgegordon.org. Now, the Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, business, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events. So, stay tuned for tonight's special report on reality behind the news when we come back. You know, those who already walk submissively will say that there's no cause for alarm, but submissiveness is not our heritage. The First Amendment was designed to allow rebellion to remain as our heritage. The Constitution was designed to keep government off the backs of the people, and the Bill of Rights was added to keep the precincts of belief and expression of the press of political and social activities free from government surveillance. Do you think that's shocking? Well, I wished I'd have thought of that, but that quotation comes from Supreme Court Justice William O. Douglas. Now, our princes and our politicians beller in the halls of Congress for more taxes, more spending, more gun control, and we haven't heard anything intelligent come out of a politician's mouth in more than 75 years. Now, have we? That's why I contend that the only real reason, logic, or common sense left in America comes from our courts. It doesn't come from our political process. It doesn't come from our politicians or our lawyers or our bureaucrats. Old Mayor Rothschild summed it up with a flair when he said, You give me the money power, and I care not who makes the laws. Well, let me suggest that you give me the judicial power, and I care not who makes the laws either, because the real power in America is in our courts. It's not in our politics. Now, if you'd like to tap into that power of the courts, call us here at the law school. The number is 417-273-4967. Again, that's area code 417-273-4967. While you're at it, be sure to ask for our free general law CD package. That's a four-hour commentary on the law school. It's entertaining, it's educational, it's informative, and best of all, it's free. Our school courtroom strategy and procedure is available on compact disc for adult home education. Now, if you're online, you can go to our website. That's georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. And then click on to the archives page, and you can download that free general law CD package right there. Again, georgegordon.org, and go to the archives page. All right, we're taking a look at some of the <clears throat> news stories that have been coming up in the last few months. I call it reality behind the news. There's a story just came out of North Korea. The North Koreans attacked an island down in South Korea. And a question <clears throat> arises, well, how much can North Korea get away with? And so intent is the United States on preserving North Korea as a pariah state on behalf of China. That it just doesn't seem to matter how much aggression or how egregious the provocation. Neither the United States nor South Korea will make the North Koreans pay. This week, the North Koreans attacked the tiny military outpost island of Yongpyong with over 170 artillery rounds. And they killed a couple of soldiers and a couple of civilians, and they wounded 18 more. Well, this entire village was destroyed, <clears throat> and there have been over 160 such acts. 160 of these kinds of acts of war since 1953. A pitiful UN-brokered ceasefire was affected in 1953, which was meant to save North Korea and China from total defeat. So the U.S., always pandering to the United Nations, has never raised a finger to punish North Korea. So this week, let's analyze why. 
In typical U.S. diplomatic language, the United States called for a measured and unified response. And what this means is no use of force and no really harmful sanctions, though they will always pretend that they're harsh. As a further gesture of military support, the U.S. sent a carrier task force to conduct naval exercises with South Korea. There were a number of amateur conspiracy theorists trying to make the most of this, claiming this was either a prelude to World War III or an attempt by North Korea to divert U.S. forces away from Iran. That's poppycock. It's simply more of North Korean saber-rattling, which has several recurring motives, despite its longevity, thanks to protection by Russia and China. North Korea has always been a very unstable dictatorship. All of the hereditary descendants of the Kim dynasty have been spoiled. They're little chubby fanatics that must constantly be pampered and coddled by their protectors. The real power behind the throne is the military. Now, the military has a lot of eager beaver young and mid-level officers trying to take every opportunity to make themselves heroes by attacking the South Koreans. The top brass tolerates these provocations not only because they give outlet to all of these hyped-up propagandists that they feed their fanatical soldiers, but it serves as an ongoing test of how soft the West really is, something the communists have always been divided about. So on the one hand, there are those that are convinced the U.S. is a paper tiger and want to go to war now in order to liberate South Korea. On the other hand are those that are suspicious that the U.S. has a secret game plan and that they are outwardly playing the fool to set the trap for them. At the Chinese level, which ultimately controls North Korea, there is the long-term strategy of preparing North Korea to be the sacrificial lamb, triggering a real Third World War. Thus, the Chinese, too, have a motive for keeping the North Korea military rabid and fanatic. Admiral Mike Mullen, the head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said China's leadership was absolutely critical in light of its influence on North Korea. Of course, that's what they learn at the National War College, taught by the CFR-type globalists. It's all nonsense. The U.S. and its allies always play the game of looking to China to rein in its puppet terrorist state, but that's never going to happen. China is North Korea's door to all commercial products, including luxury goods for North Korea's pudgy and spoiled current leader Kim, Il, Kim, uh, Kim Jong-il. And more importantly, North Korea has always been one of China's thorns in the sight of the West, a way for China to provoke and to test U.S. permissiveness in foreign affairs without doing it directly. Now, since the 1953 ceasefire agreement, which is not a true peace treaty, there have been more than 160 attacks by North Korea on South Korea, some of which have involved the death of American soldiers. There have been, for example, if you got a pen and paper, why don't you jot down some of these so you can tell your husband or your wife over dinner tonight. I was kind of surprised when I read this. It's in the World Affairs Brief. It's the November 26th issue. It's put out by a guy named Joel Skousen. <clears throat> if you... Uh, <clears throat> If you've got your pen and paper, write this down. It's www.worldaffairsbrief. That's all one word. Worldaffairsbrief.com. I don't know what the price is. <clears throat> I guess you can send him an email or ask. <clears throat> Dynamite. World Affairs Brief. Commentary and insights on a troubled world. You ready? Get your pen and paper. Take this down. 
three hijackings of South Korean airliners, two fighter attacks on U.S. reconnaissance aircraft with a loss of 31 lives, 24 commando attacks of infiltration in South Korea, one seizing of a U.S. intelligence ship, remember the USS Pueblo, two ambushes, attacks on American soldiers, six dead, several wounded. Two killings of South Korean citizens abroad, six assassination attempts, nine abductions of South Korean citizens, three bombs planted, two submarine invasions, numerous infiltration tunnels dug under the demilitarized zone. Some of these tunnels are big enough for trucks. Did you get that? That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's 11 big attacks. Out of 160, there's 11 big. Every one of these are called acts of war. Acts of war. Nobody, you know, in this country wants to go to war against North Korea. There's nothing to be gained. At least war with Iraq has something to be gained. The Iraqis over there have 25% of the world's oil. Afghanistan has an advantage. They've just discovered or just <clears throat> revealed to us that they have a trillion dollars worth of these uh, rare earths in Afghanistan. That's important. But I think more important is that Afghanistan is the world's biggest supplier of heroin. And under the Taliban, they had eradicated it. And under the Americans, it is now at world record production levels. Isn't that special? Now, can you imagine the U.S. response if Iran had done any one of these acts of war? It would have given the United States and Israel the excuse that they're looking for to attack Iran. So, as I have pointed out many times in this brief, there is a huge dichotomy in U.S. foreign policy towards so-called hostile states. Some are protected and some are punished. My explanation is that this hypocrisy is really a plan to set up for future war, which our own globalist government wants, for Hegelian purposes, of course, as do the communists in China and Russia. Hegel, remember, is the guy that came up with the thesis, antithesis. That is, you control both sides of the, of the issue to create conflict. And then you come in and you suggest the solution to the conflict that you created, which is what you wanted everybody to do in the first place, but which neither side wanted. So it's called dialectics. It's been going on now, at least for the last, oh, 100 years, pretty hot and heavy, at least here in the United States. It's, a, it's a, a program that's been going on since the Garden of Eden. Satan is probably the originator of it. Well, many conservative South Koreans, including the president and his own ruling Grand National Party, are understandably angry over the tepid and soft reaction of the government to this latest armed intrusion. Many thought that the military, at least, ought to have conducted airstrikes on the artillery units doing the shooting. North Korea excuses its actions based on ongoing border disputes. The South Korean military has conducted an artillery exercise firing out into the open sea, which North Korea claims. So how does that justify attacking an island and killing people? Well, it doesn't. But this isn't about justice or fairness. And it's not really about provocations either, but more taunting and giving the North Korean military something to keep them reveling in the future day when they will show the West who is boss. Americans will someday be just as sorry or angry over U.S. permissiveness. Very few Americans realize that our 28,000 U.S. troops stationed in South Korea are in fact in harm's way literal sitting ducks waiting for a North Korean surprise attack. And they could be easily overrun 
given the massive military advantage of the North Koreans on the northern side, and the tens of thousands of artillery tubes alone could make U.S. barracks and even the capital city a wasteland in as little as an hour. And what will our government tell us then? Are they going to say, gee, we didn't know this was coming? And indeed they will. And then that will be another lie, just like Pearl Harbor. And it will lead to an instant cry for war when that happens. And so let's sit back and let's think about this for a minute. <clears throat> when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, was that a surprise? There wasn't any surprise there. Our side knew that they were going to attack. We had already broken the Japanese code. So President Roosevelt sacrificed those 3,000 Americans at Pearl Harbor to create the excuse and the justification that we needed to go to war against Japan, which we had already provoked by putting an embargo on their oil imports from Indonesia. Now, North Korea is being used, being, being, being taunted by us, by the powers that be, so that when the time is right and the North Koreans attack the South, then we'll say, well, okay, see, we, we didn't know this was going to happen. And you're gonna, your adrenaline will flow. You'll get really upset and excited and say, by God, we won't take this. You know, the time to, to stop a fight is long before it gets started. Time to stop that North Korean crap over there is to do it right now while you've got the strength to do it. But we won't, and we haven't, and we're not going to. And then at the opportune time, now with the Iranians, and we're looking for an excuse, and we're, 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 we're doggedly attempting to, to incite them to do something so that we can justify our attack. It, it'll come one of these days. Whether it's the Trade Towers or a Pearl Harbor or a Gulf of Tonkin. Or <clears throat> these are black flag operations. Now, the guy that <clears throat> recovers or, or uncovers most of this black flag operations is this guy, Joel Skousen, in the World Affairs Brief. That's why I like to recommend him from time to time. Now, Americans will someday be just as sorry when this happens. And I, Skousen says, I feel sorry for these patriotic soldiers. Most of them believe their leaders will do what's best for America and do what's best to protect them. At least that's the way it is trumpeted to the world by the President and the Congress. But little do these Americans know that they are someday going to be betrayed to the mother of all terrorism, permitting a full nuclear strike to descend upon them. My message to them is don't be in the military when that happens. Don't, don't go out here and join the army. Now, in World War III, if you want to know who's going to win, the first round is going to go to the Russians and Chinese. The Americans are going to lose, and we're going into national captivity. And if you want a, an introductory to that, you go to the book of Ezekiel in the Bible. And then you Australians and Canadians are going right along with us. So it'll be the Australians, the Canadians, and the Americans going into, going into national captivity. There is a limit to how much we can get away with, and I think we've gone way past that limit. And I'm surprised that God hasn't taken action already, but you know. And the day will come, and when the axe falls, it's going to fall hard and heavy. All right, so there's the first story by Joel. Now, NATO comes into the game here. NATO. You know, that's the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. That's there to protect Europe, remember? We're going to protect Europe against communist aggression. Well, boys and girls, the communists have already won the war. I mean, we're not... We're not... Uh, we're not naive enough to think now that we Americans over here practicing the tenth plank to the Communist Manifesto by sending our children to public schools have somehow enlightened the rest of the world to the glories of homeschooling or the Bible now, do you? We have the occultists now in political power 
who are now teaching us to practice sodomy in this country and to accept it. Oh, boys and girls. <clears throat> the creator of the universe has reminded us numerous times in the scripture about Sodom and Gomorrah and their overthrow, their destruction. Honest to God, Americans, do you believe that you can do what the Sodomites couldn't do in Sodom and Gomorrah and get away with it? Now, for the rest of us out here, you know, when the fire and brimstone comes down, it kills everybody. It kills the Sodomites and the the rest of us that have um, been the enablers. When you ask Americans today, you know what they think, that the polls, if these polls are correct, 64% of Americans are in favor of this of this uh, sodomite change in the uh, in the military, you know the don't ask, don't tell. Just just come right out and tell everybody. You know I'm a sodomite, and so there you are. <clears throat> I don't know where the end is here, but it's coming to an end. And the communists now have been the clear victors. We Americans practice all ten planks to the communist manifesto. You don't see. Our Bill of Rights and those ten provisions put into play in China or Russia. But we do see the ten planks from China and Russia in play in the United States, Canada, and Australia. Tuck it away in your hearts. Now over in Europe, you would have thought that it was an East-West celebration at the NATO-Russia summit in Lisbon this week. The French and Belgians are fronting for globalist leaders, promoting the notion that Russia is no longer an enemy, and said as much during the conference. NATO, it appears, has become the new Neville Chamberlain of World War III. Here are the words of the Secretary General, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, of the NATO-Russia Council at the level of ministers. He said, We have come to a turning point in relations between the 29 countries in the NATO-Russia Council. All the nations represented here today understand that our security is indivisible. We share important interests and face the same threats to our common security, as if terror was the only threat, dubious as it is. The time has clearly come to modernize our relationship and build a true partnership. This is a proposal to bring Russia into NATO. God, you talk about a Trojan horse now, huh? Let's bring that horse into the city. <clears throat> the West has already been infiltrated and taken over. Now, the last step in this, in this New World Order plan over here is to foment a World War III to get the rest of us over here to accept this world government, just like they did back at the Tower of Babel. That's been the occult plan, which started about 2000 B.C., or was stifled about 2000 B.C. So for 4,000 years, it's been, it's been their plan. Now, it's just about to come to fruition. And the Russians are going to be a part of this partnership. Now, all of our <coughs> countries face another growing threat as well, the proliferation of ballistic missiles. It's a threat that we can best defend against together. Starting today, we will begin working to see how to pursue NATO-Russia missile defense cooperation. There are many issues still to address, but the most important point is this. For the first time, NATO nations and Russia will discuss cooperation or cooperating to protect together European territory and populations. Excuse me. Excuse me, boys and girls. God, I can hardly contain myself. Protect them against what? <laughs> what? Huh? Huh? Come on. At least, <clears throat> at least be rational and intelligent here. Are you telling me that these Taliban terrorists now are going to attack NATO and Russia and Western Europe and that they're a great threat and we need to join with the Russians now? <laughs> come, come on. You know, surely if you're past the third grade, you ought to be able to see through that kind of ruse. And that's what these guys are selling us. And now our president and our Congress now, through this lame duck session, they want to give us this new START treaty. The, the, the 
the game plan here, boys and girls, is to weaken the United States to the greatest possible extent. Strengthen Russia and China to the greatest possible extent. And then we'll unleash World War III. Well, okay, now that's already been accomplished. I'm not sure when this is going to transpire next year, the year after. I, I don't don't ask me that. I'm not a prophet. God isn't isn't telling me what's going on what's going on or coming down here. But just looking at Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Revelation, Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. Deuteronomy 28 and Leviticus 26. You know, you put this story together, and World War III is in the offing. It's not in the offing because I said so. It's in the offing because Ezekiel, Jeremiah, and Moses said so. Your Creator said so. And now when we look at the Jesuits and Voltaire, and the ma major Jesuit writers, you know, back in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century. They planned World War I and executed it. They planned World War II and executed it. And they've planned World War III. We don't know when they're going to execute it. But there's a little doubt in my mind that it's coming. So I thought I would report it to you. <coughs> Joel Skousen is reporting it. Now get this, <clears throat> when there is this much disconnect between military intelligence, which monitors the Russian ballistic missile threat, and politicians, which simply refuse to even mention Russian remilitarization, you know there is a silent agenda going on here. Russia is more than willing to take advantage of the foolishness on the part of NATO. Now, Russian President Medvedev made a proposal to NATO leaders that Europe be divided into sectors of military responsibility. Russia would handle the eastern sector and NATO the west. Incredibly, the only discussion on the table is how to protect the continent from rogue missile attacks from terrorist states, as if there were any. What, 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 excuse me, beep, 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 beep. wait a minute here. Do you mean to tell me that you're expecting North Korea or Iran to launch missiles against Russia or, or Europe? Boys and girls, even if they did, it would be the pimple on the elephant's trunk. Our enemies are sitting over there with, with uh, half the nuclear weapons in the world. And the powers that be are going to use Russia and China as their vehicle to implement this new world order. We haven't been paying attention to our God. We've been paying attention to the occult leaders and practicing sodomy in our spare time. And then making excuses and spending ourselves into bankruptcy. And we haven't been spending attention or paying attention or spending our time looking at the real threat. I think that uh, Skousen hit the nail on the head here. The, the, the threat to us is from the Russians and the Chinese. But you and I aren't going to change the powers that be. But when this nuclear bomb war comes, do you want to be sitting across the street from Central Park? Or do you want to be out in Central Kansas? I just ask you, you know, it's your choice to make. Think about it. Um, you know, what about the 800-pound gorilla that's in the room? Russia with the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the world. What cannot be lost upon military planners is that this is a ploy on the part of Western appeasers in Russia working together. We think it is to make sure that U.S. anti-ballistic missile defenses are not placed within the former Eastern European states. The closer anti-ballistic missile systems are placed to Russian launch sites, the better they're able to intercept Russian missiles in their boost phase, which takes out not only the missile, but all of its multiple warheads. If you wait to shoot something down once it has released its warheads, you have to hit a much smaller 
and supersonic target. Almost impossible with the type of ABM system the U.S. is using that has no warhead. So it's obvious that NATO and U.S. leaders don't want to acknowledge that threat. Remember, this is the World Affairs Brief. We give credit where credit's due here. It's published by Joel M. Skousen. www.worldaffairsbrief, all one word, dot com. Hey, we're at about the halfway point here. I guess I <coughs> can give you the uh, reminder that you're listening to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. We are sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. The Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. I'm your narrator, George Gordon. The Law Hour and Editorial Review is heard nationally and internationally seven days a week here in the United States and more than 120 countries worldwide over the Internet. If you'd like more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, please visit our webpage at georgegordon.org. Again, that's georgegordon.org. The Law Hour and Editorial Review brings you important information about law, science, education, business, politics, religion, health, history, economics, news, and current events, and we do that every day. Now, the Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States. We're heard around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. If you'd like more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, then please go to our website at georgegordon.org. Now, the Law School is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school that is open to individuals, but by prearrangement. All of these Law Hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience, and the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. Now, the Law School offers a free four-hour introductory CD package. Be sure to order one by calling and asking for it. The number is 417-273-4967. Once more, that's area code 417-273-4967. Now, the sources of information that we use on this program are true, accurate, and correct to the best of our knowledge and belief, and the Law Hour and Editorial Review gives credit to those authors and publications that we use on this program, and we often endorse or recommend books, papers, periodicals, and newsletters to our listeners. These endorsements and recommendations that we give don't mean that the authors or the publications that we're endorsing are necessarily going to reciprocate. Keep in mind that most of these authors and publications that we cite here on the Law Hour may be hostile, political, religious, economic, sectarian, racial, or ethnic partisans, and their viewpoints may not be totally endorsed by the Law Hour and editorial review either. These opinions, beliefs, comments, views, and expressions that you hear on this program are mine and mine alone. They don't necessarily represent the views, beliefs, or the opinions of the advertisers, the sponsors, the management, or the staff of this radio network or of this local radio station. If you'd like more information about the Law Hour and Editorial Review, then please go to our website. That's georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org, or you can call us direct at 417-273-4967. And we're taking a look here at the reality behind the news. There's been a push now for this New START treaty. The lame duck session, as I speak, is still in session. But <clears throat> the White House is trying to ram the latest strategic nuclear treaty through the U.S. Senate during the lame duck session, where they have the most votes. The Constitution requires a two-thirds supermajority for passage in the Senate. This would require all of the Democrats to vote for it, plus eight ignorant or compromising Republicans. Ratification of the New START Treaty is another attempt to foist disarmament upon the United States. This foolish move by the United States is just as astounding as NATO's embrace of Russia defending its eastern border, and leads me to conclude that this can't be simple stupidity or naivete. It's almost agonizing to read the prime justification for this treaty. That without it, the U.S. would lose the right to continue inspections verifying Russia's compliance with disarmament agreements. I want you to notice that this implies two gross falsehoods. 
first of all, that the United States has actually verified Russian compliance, which it has not, is not, and never will. The Russians won't allow it. Haven't, don't now, and never will. Number two, that Russia ever was in compliance, which they are not, never have, and never will be. Now, the United States has never been allowed into all Russian missile facilities, only some of them. So there has been no verification. Inspections have never included Russia's huge underground bunker factory city in the Urals. It's called Yemen 2 Mountain. Russia is not even in compliance with the just expired agreement signed with George W. Bush upon which this argument or continuing uh, of continuing inspections and compliance is based. In setting up the arguments for passage, these globalist proponents of disarmament make some admissions and some falsehoods. Peter Boxbaum, writing for ISN News, has the details. Russia has expressly reserved the right to walk away from the treaty if it believes the United States has significantly increased its missile defense capability. Unquote. Now, that tells us a lot about what the Russians are really worried about. What they're really worried about. That the U.S. may be able to intercept a nuclear first strike. This provision is, in all other ways, an open door to disregard or to withdraw. They've opted out of every agreement before, even when there was no opt-out clause like the modern agreements have. Administration supporters acknowledge the missile defense language in the treaty, but argue that those provisions are of no consequence to U.S. ballistic missile defense plans. Buck's bomb then proceeds to quote from Morton Halperin, a former official in the U.S. Departments of State and Defense, and notorious one world globalist associated with the CFR. And he told the ISN, quote, in this area, the administration followed precisely the recommendations of the Perry Schlesinger Commission. The commission's report, more formally, the final report of the Congressional Commission on the Strategic Posture of the United States, recommended that the U.S. focus on regional missile defenses while avoiding stepping on the toes of Russia or China. Oh my God, heaven forbid that we should defend ourselves in a way that might offend our declared enemies. I want to pause here and remind you that one of the top generals in China, just recently, I mean within the last year, I saw a report come across my desk. And he said, the war with the United States is inevitable. Inevitable. I just wanted to report to you, boys and girls, that the North Koreans are, have been preparing, are now preparing, and are going to continue preparing for war. <clears throat> now, the Russians, and I've reported this a time or two to you, the Russians, <clears throat> Gorbachev, and this perestroika, and so on, <clears throat> have always said that they're communists and will always be communists. What we're facing here is they're turning a smile to us. Hey, we're, we're nice guys. You'll like us. To get us to let down our guard. And when they think they can destroy us, when they think they can win, that's when they're going to attack us. They have always been planning to attack us. They have always been planning to destroy us. Our God has been warning us, your enemies are going to destroy you. And if you don't shape up and practice my law, I am going to withdraw my protection from you. Now, let me tell you a little story here. In World War II, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. And when they did, it was the kiss of death for Japan. And the reason that it was the kiss of death is because, boys and girls, the United States, Australia, Great Britain, Ireland, Wales, England, Scotland, 
the United States. We have a covenant. We have a contract with the creator of the universe in which, under the terms and conditions of the contract, he's obligated to defend us. That's why we have this prophecy in Leviticus 26 that says, Your enemies will come out against you one way, and they will flee before you seven ways. Well, to give you an illustration, World War II started for us, that is, we Yanks over here, on December the 7th, 19. 41. Six months later, in June 1942, the American Navy destroyed the Japanese Navy at Midway Island. And from that day forward, the Japanese never fought another offensive battle. Every battle from that point on was defensive, and every battle from that point on, from, from America's point of view, was an offensive battle. Now, you know, most people look at that and say, well, it's just because we're superior military strategists. Oh, I, <laughs> I would beg to differ with you, but, you know, you're, you're welcome to your opinion. Our God had a duty, had an obligation. Now, we have an obligation, and that is to practice the Ten Commandments, to practice the law of God. And so I... <clears throat> showed you yesterday, and I'm going to show you once more. It's in, it's in Ezekiel 14.14, 14, where he says, if, uh, if Noah, Job, and Daniel combined were praying for you, they couldn't save you. In verse 14, he says, though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, they should deliver but their own souls by their righteousness, says the Eternal. These guys couldn't save you. I can't save you. I'm not going to do anything for you. And you're not going to do anything for me. But there's a lot that you can do for yourself. I mean, you can save yourself. You can save your family. World War III is coming. You can save yourself out of World War III. You can save your life. I can't do it for you. Furthermore, Noah, Daniel, and Job couldn't save you either. And there's a reason for that. He says in verse 22, Yet behold, therein shall be left a remnant. There's going to be some survivors that shall be brought forth, both sons and daughters. And they shall be brought forth, and you shall see their way, that their doings, that you shall be comforted concerning the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem. That's the buzzword, remember, for Israel. It's the buzzword for Israel, the United States, Great Britain, and Australia. The three that didn't get it in World War II are going to get it in World War III. <clears throat> so that I bring it to your attention. And in verse 12, he said, The word of the Eternal came unto me, saying, Son of man, when the land sins against me by trespassing grievously, then I'll stretch out my hand upon it, and I'll break the staff of bread thereof. That's famine. And I'll send famine upon it, and I'll cut off the man and beast from it. That's why I pointed out to you. It said, I think you'd be better off in Kansas than New York City. But then people, once they get, they get put into the cities, they get used to the easy lifestyle of the city. The living is much easier in San Francisco than it is out on the farm. And I don't deny it. I'm not here to, to tell you how easy and how wonderful it is out here in the country. But at least there's subsistence and survival out here in the country. The Chinese now are delivering our garlic to us, our sworn enemies, with the Chinese general. It says, war with the West is inevitable. He had a little bit more to say than that, you know, but that was the essential crux of the message. So, yep, yep, they're, they're planning for it. The Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, yep, they're getting ready for it. Tuck it away in your heart because God himself is going to bring it upon us. And then it's not because of their great generals. It's because of our wickedness and our sin. And this time around, God is not going to protect us. That's the tragedy of it. And why isn't he going to protect us? Because of our sin. Sin. That's our criminal behavior. That's our witchcraft and occult behavior. That's our practicing things like Halloween. 
You know, you want to practice Halloween, stick right out there. <clears throat> now, Boxbaum then proceeds to quote from Morton Halperin. Remember, he was a former official in the U.S. State Department. Our State Department, if you think if you think that our State Department now run by Hillary Clinton over here is the bastion of American values, you want to remember that that woman is a communist. Her husband, Bill Clinton, is a communist. Those two are sworn to protect and instigate communism. They're socialists at best and communists at worst. And that woman is in control of the State Department. And then you've got another socialist communist, Barack Obama, heading the White House. Your government is permeated with your enemies. And your God now is going to withhold his protection from us. Last paragraph. Nor is Halperin worried about Russian threats to withdraw from the treaty if the United States builds up its missile defenses. The United States, while it hasn't said it, also reserves the right to withdraw from the treaty if the Russians build up their defenses. Well, the trouble is the U.S. never does withdraw, even when the Russians are, in fact, found increasing their arsenal. When the Russians said that they are not going to comply with the provisions of the last START treaty to dismantle all their SS-18 uh, Satan missiles, the U.S. went ahead and dismantled all 50 of our MX missiles anyway. Got that? They were supposed to <clears throat> dismantle their SS-18s, and we'll dismantle our 50 MX missiles. And then so we went ahead and destroyed ours, and they didn't destroy theirs. Stupidity? No, no way. More like setting us up for war. In other words, <clears throat> the powers that be are setting us up for World War III. And when World War III comes down now, remember I did a series here. I told you about this EMP threat. Boy, that's going to be a corker, that EMP. <clears throat> if you think life is tough in America today, you wait until that EMP goes off. <laughs> you wait until this World War III comes down. I want to I want to remind all of you, <clears throat> here in America, <clears throat> they're talking about, you know, we got unemployment, and oh my God, and how bad things are. You people on unemployment, right now today, living on unemployment insurance, are living better than half of the world's population. Unemployed and on welfare, you live better than the average world citizen. The average man in the world is making 2 to $5 a day. On minimum wage, if you're working flipping burgers, you're making $7 an hour. And you wonder why these people are swimming across the Rio Grande River to get into the United States. Boys and girls, it's bad out there in the world and getting worse. And at the very same time that all this is going on, we are disarming. 50% of our food comes in from overseas. 99% of our shoes... Our nation has been spent into bankruptcy, and now we're going to sign a new treaty <laughs> with the Russians, who have never kept their word on any treaty they've made with us in the past. What make you think they're going to keep their words now? <clears throat> Boys and girls, this is a setup. <clears throat> Get ready for it. Now, <clears throat> China and Russia have just dropped the dollar in international trade. <clears throat> Uh, our enemies over here are smart enough to figure out that the dollar is going to zero. I'm not sure that Americans have figured out that it's going to zero, but so that you you'll know that it is. I just wanted to report it to you. When is this going to happen? Well, the Chinese and the Russians have dropped it now. They're going to conduct their trade in rubles and and uh, yuan. So you might want to be thinking about yourself. I don't think you're going to save America or save anybody else, but you could if you got after it. You might be able to save yourself and your own family here. And then there's the Irish bailout, the beginning or the end of the European financial trouble. Well, listen, the EU Central Bank 
has negotiated a $90 billion euro bailout for Ireland's troubled banks with funds from the UK and even the FED, that's the Federal Reserve of America, eliciting an angry outcry from Americans that we have no business bailing out Ireland. Now, The Guardian had an excellent commentary on the growing fallout in Europe. Financial markets were thrown into turmoil today amid fears that an imminent collapse of Ireland's beleaguered government would have a knock-on effect across the Eurozone, and the announcement of the potential $90 billion, inter, or $90 billion, it's Euro, $90 billion Euro, international bailout for debt-laden Ireland, of which the UK could contribute up to 10 billion pounds, offered only a temporary respite to nervous market. By tonight, Concerns that Portugal and even Spain might also need their own rescue packages were rising and sent the euro and shares falling while the risk of holding the debt of potentially vulnerable countries rose alarmingly. These are called the pigs countries. Pigs, that's Portugal, Ireland, Greece, Italy, and Spain. Those five. They're bankrupt and they're all going to need to be bailed out. Now, Greece was the first one, Ireland's the second one, Portugal will be third. And if it's unsuccessful, at that point, Spain or Italy will be fourth, and then the next one, fifth. France, by the way, is now insolvent, unable to meet their obligations. Now, the three biggest members of the European Union are Germany, France, and, and Great Britain. Great Britain is bankrupt. France is bankrupt. There's no way you can bail those two countries out. And that's why <clears throat> yesterday I pointed out to you an international forecaster talking about economics that the die is cashed. We've, we've already got the 300-foot hole down the side of the ship. Nothing's going to save this thing now. <clears throat> the damage is already done. If we were going to be saved, it had to have been done years ago. And it's going to, it's going to take great austerity. The, the commission that was put into effect here by Barack Obama made their recommendations. I looked at some of the recommendations, and then I measured that against the Grace Commission report back in the 80s. Here's the kicker. Here's what it boils down to. Back in the 80s, they warned that there's certain spending that they have no control over. For instance, you have no control over Social Security and Medicare and uh, veterans' benefits and pensions and things like that. You can't cut those. Those are guaranteed by law. See, they're, they're written in. And then where, where you have discretionary spending is with the defense budget. You could, you could cut that. And then you can you can cut infrastructure spending. You can you can postpone building a bridge, or you can postpone repairs on a highway. Boys and girls, it's now to the point where 67 percent of all of the spending in the federal budget is already programmed in. You've only got 33 percent that you can work with. Now we're to the point where you can't even mess with the 33% and affect the savings that are needed in order to balance the budget. This is why the budget is out of control. There, there isn't any bringing it under control. I mean, you can forget that. Now, Nancy Pelosi said, we're not going to take any of these harsh economic pills. Well, okay. That, that tells you the story right there. So then you're going to continue on until the thing just collapses. You'll just wake up one morning, and then there just won't be any stuff on the shelf. And then what are you going to do? I think, and I think that reason, logic, and common sense dictates that when disaster is coming, you want to mitigate it to the greatest extent possible. You know, it's kind of like we're, we're in an airplane, and the, the airplane lost an engine, and that's bad, and we need to land, and we need to do it now. And somebody says, no, we're going to keep on going. So we keep on going pretty soon, the second engine goes up. 
and somebody says, we need to land, we need to, this is an emergency. No, 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 we'll just keep on going. By the time the third engine goes out, we're going down, but now there's no airport. <laughs> so we're going down and we're going to crash. My suggestion is let's crash in an open wheat field. And these guys say, no, no. <laughs> Nancy Pelosi said, no, no, we're going to continue on until the last engine gives out over the mountains. Uh, boys and girls, that's going to spell disaster. And <clears throat> that's where it's heading. Ben Bernanke said the other day on 60 Minutes, he said, we're going to continue on with the quantitative easing. So on the one hand, you've got the President's Commission and Erskine Bowles saying, we've got austerity and we've got to do it now or else, and he's an emotional fellow, you know, he gets excited. <clears throat> and then you've got Nancy Pelosi says, no way in hell are we going to do this. And so years ago, I kind of figured that that's probably the way this thing was going to come down. Instead of making an intelligent decision when there was one engine out, let's land at the next available airport. Yes, it'll be an inconvenience, and yeah, we're not going to make it to where we want to go on time, but you know, it's the logical thing to do. And they said, no, continue on. And so then the second engine goes out, and so now it's an emergency. Now we need to land at any available airport. And somebody says, no. The third engine goes out, and then we're going to land because now the airplane is going to crash. The logical thing to do then, in my view, is to crash straight and level straight ahead in the wheat field. And they said, no, no. We're at the crash position. So now the question is, are we going to crash in a wheat field or are we going to crash into a mountain? And the answer is, Ben Bernanke and Nancy Pelosi said, we're going into the side of a mountain. You just got it on the news. So I'm just sitting here <clears throat> reporting to you from the international forecaster and from the world affairs brief. This is what they're telling you. This is what's coming down. Then the next step is going to be the destruction of the United States. When we go out of the game, you people in Australia are dead. You people in Canada, <clears throat> when we sneeze, you get pneumonia. Wake up and smell the coffee. And then we're on our way out. So that means that every family <clears throat> should start looking closer to the Ten Commandments and closer to Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. That's my view. It's my suggestion. And the airplane is already <clears throat> running on one engine, and it's going to quit shortly. We don't know just when, but when it does, the mountains are straight ahead. Hey, i got to give you a reminder here <clears throat> in, a, in a minute or two. But I want to give you the address of this uh, World Affairs Brief one more time. It's www.worldaffairsbrief.com. guy's name is Joel Skousen. He's a, he's a genuine conservative, and he's, he's a genuine American pa patriot. He's in the minority. <clears throat> There's only a few like him, and when it's all said and done, he'll probably die there in Provo, Utah, <clears throat> in, the, in the chaos that envelops the nation when this thing turns turtle. But I wish him the best, and uh, he's probably got some information over the next year or two that can be of great benefit to you in helping you and your family survive this. The, the, the die is set. The, the uh, controls are on automatic pilot in the mountains straight ahead. That's Joel Skousen, the World Affairs Brief, www.worldaffairsbrief.com. Hey, I'm out of time. i got to give you a final reminder here that you have been listening to the Law Hour and Editorial Review. We're sponsored by the Gordon Law School of Isabella, Missouri. Now, the Law Hour is heard seven days a week here in the United States. We're heard around the world in more than 120 countries daily over the Internet and radio. If you'd like more information about the Law School and the Law Hour, please go to our website at georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. The law school is a private, non-commercial, non-profit, non-sectarian law school. It is open to individuals, but by prearrangement. The law school conducts a homeschooling program for adults and compact disc, and the Law Hour website is updated weekly. It has a radio log schedule and archives. All of that can be accessed through our website at georgegordon.org, georgegordon.org. All of these Law Hour programs are archived on the Internet by title and date for your listening convenience. And the Law Hour is an educational service brought to you in the public interest. 
Hey, time's up. i got to leave it right there. We'll see you back here tomorrow night. Same time, same station. God willing, of course. So until then, thanks for listening, everybody. And until tomorrow, good night, friends. <laughs>